Good evening. I would like to call the March 12th meeting of the Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee to order. With that, could I have a motion to adopt this evening's agenda? A motion we adopt the agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor so signify? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you very much. Our agenda is adopted. With that, I hope everybody's had a chance to look over the minutes from the February 13th <coughs> meeting. Do I have a motion to adopt last month's minutes? A motion that we adopt last month's minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Are there any discussion of those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor so signify? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Before we do the next item, yes. can we mention that people got the invitation to the event and that needs to be turned into Derek before you leave? Unless we still don't know yet, in which case he will accept them later. <laughs> He'll chase us down. He's uh, already commented. Uh, it's another problem with having children. <laughs> but uh, if you haven't turned it into Derek, please uh, fill it out and let them know if you will or won't attend the event. The first sheet on your packet. Yep. On April 14th. So with that now, Wally, you are up for the CIP presentation discussions. Good evening. We appreciate everybody being able to get here this evening. Um, We've had several meetings to discuss the capital improvement plan. Uh, I think we all know how important, how important of a document that truly is. That's what we base our system development fees on. That's what goes into our budgeting. That's what goes into our rate model uh, to help us determine rates. So uh, tonight is kind of the last piece of the puzzle for you. Um, in January, we talked about the ongoing FY20 projects that we're, we're currently working on. Uh, in your February meeting, we went over the planned projects, those projects that were already identified in this, the capital improvement plan from years 21 through 29. And tonight is kind of the last piece of that puzzle. So that will be the new projects that we're proposing, any that may come in in FY30, which is the last year of the 10-year the CIP, and then any projects we're proposing changes on, and we do have quite a few. Just as a quick reminder, a capital improvement plan project typically takes 12 months to complete. It's, it's construction in nature. It, the cost exceeds $50,000. It has a useful life of five years. And then as we're going in and planning those projects, we use uh, several factors to identify projects and to prioritize them. And some of those factors include our mobile 311 system, well, which I'll show you a snapshot of in just a second, that tracks all of our work orders and our history with you know, water main repairs, water service repairs, sewer repairs. Um, all the way down to if we do any sort of insulation or when we do maintenance on our pump stations. And then for growth, we have several master plans that we follow. We have a water, sewer, water model and a sewer model. So we use all of those put together to develop the tenure, the projects that you see in the tenure window. And then we compare those against our, our rate model. So I talked a little bit about our, our work order system. It's called Mobile 311. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the sewer repairs we've done over the last, uh, this is over the last year, so 365 days. Uh, it's not a calendar year, it's just a rolling year. And you can see that um, we've repaired, you know, over 260 or 70 some um, items related to sewer. With water, we're well over 600. I think we're around 650 or so. And you can see that the bulk of those are water service. So the good thing, if there is a good thing, the good thing about those is it's typically between the main and the meter on a smaller line. And a lot of times they're out of the road. Not always, but a lot of times they're out of the road. 
So in many cases, we can dig down on those and, and fix them very quickly. So those would be cases where the leak is before somebody's meter and they start noticing a wet spot in their yard. Correct. Okay. Or right at the edge of the curb line or, or something like that. And you can see that we have a, a large number of those. And specifically, there's a, a project that I'm, t I'm going to talk about that's a new project that's proposed, and it's based uh, on those service repairs that we're making. And then I talked about our water and sewer master plans and our modeling. Um, this is just a snapshot of the Henderson Basin. I know you've seen this before, but the uh, red and yellow you see down in this area shows line, sewer lines and manholes that we currently have challenges with under heavy rain periods. Um, the yellow and reds are not good. It doesn't mean that anything's getting out of the system, but that's so sewers flowing full when we get heavy rain events. And then you can kind of see, we look at um, the lighter purple is developed areas, but the darker purple is those undeveloped lots or lots that we could still see development on. So there is some vacant lots there. And you can see that there's about 30, 330 acres in this basin of undeveloped lots. So that's infrastructure is there or very close by. And really the development just can tie in with, you know, the extension of some mains. And then we have future areas that we've identified that are kind of within the basin, but the mains are, you know, the backbone infrastructure is not quite there. So, you know, those would take greater improvements, but are areas that will likely come into that system in the future. This is a snapshot of the, the Brookview Basin. So the, the last one was Henderson, this is Brookview. These are the two basins that we're seeing the highest growth potential in, and it's along that Western Gum Branch corridor. Um, you can see that, again, we're kind of sticking with a yellow and orange or pink theme here, but again, that the yellows are developed, the um, pink or orangish color that you see there are undeveloped lots that are already in that basin, and the white, again, is potential growth areas. In addition, we, we track everybody that we talk to for potential developments. And I highlight these three because there is current engineering work by a private engineer on behalf of the property owners for these three developments. They, um, starting, this is, this development is already in city limits. Um, that is full build out somewhere around 500, give or take sing single family homes and um, just over 36 acres of commercial development along Gumbridge Road. So that's a significant development that's currently being worked on. Um, the first, of course, 500 homes isn't going to build out overnight. That takes time. Um, but the first phase is somewhere in the 200 home mark, um, as we've talked to uh, the representative. And then we have uh, two developments kind of along um, Ramsey Road. The, the uppermost is 128 lots, and the, the lower one is 68 lots. And the lower and lower, this, the 68 lots um, will actually tie into Carolina Forest with some of their roadway connections. So these are the things that we use to plan for growth that we see in our system. Um, in addition to that, as we identify and go through these projects, you'll see that in the capital improvement plan, it says, is it surface related? Is it growth related? And if it's service related, that means that there's a benefit there to the existing customers. If it's growth related, then that project provides for future growth. And it's possible for both of those to be yes. Um, a situation where both would be yes may be an existing pump station that we're upgrading. So the current residents, current uh, water and sewer users, actually receive the benefit of you know improved infrastructure and then the growth portion may be 
you know, if it's a 200 gallon a minute station and we go to 500 gallon a minute station, you know, there's a cost incurred with that. So we would attribute that additional 300 gallons per minute to growth and it would be paid for through our system development fees. Question. In, yes, in sizing something like that, you, you mentioned that it takes a while to build out the 500 single families in there. They might take a decade to do that or more. Do you put the entire size in there or because with pumps the way they are, some don't like having less flow go through them or do you plan upscaling as it goes through? What we do is we typically plan the permanent infrastructure. So that would be, you know, the wet wells, the pipes, those kind of things that are already, they go in the ground to the size of full build out. But then you may have, you may put pumps in that only handle the flow you're planning for those phases for, a, for a smaller safe. area right. yes because if you if you put two larger pumps in a an area it's just as bad as having two smaller pumps in an area so you it's a it's a maintenance nightmare so we do plan for that you know in some cases a, a good example would be carolina force when it was originally constructed uh, the pump station in Force Main were sized for uh, part of or a portion of the development. And then as it grew, the developer actually had to come back in, upgrade the station by adding pumps, I think changing out pumps, and then ran a second Force Main, so a parallel <coughs> Force Main. So Carolina Pump Station actually has two Force Mains. Uh, so we do plan for that as part of the development. Okay, thank you. So tonight, trying to keep with a similar format, we use the Gantt chart. Uh, we'll give you, instead of really status, it'll be more of a description. And then the green is sewer, the blue is water, and the purple is kind of a combination of both water and sewer projects. So jumping in, I'll try to give you the page number as we go through this. I think that's what all my pretty flags are for that you mentioned. Um, I'll try to give you um, the page so you can kind of follow along and then I'll kind of just briefly discuss the project if you have more questions um, I may not be able to answer all of them but we have some staff here that will certainly be able to before we get into that one of your earlier charts show where you had all the service calls yes and we've had a great deal of discussion about the older infrastructure downtown but it seemed to have the least amount of uh, tags on your chart and I was wondering uh, what water repair, what what's causing that, and which is the area that is most concentrated? Are we looking at bad material in initial install, or are we looking at old stuff? What What's causing 600 <laughs> service calls for water? And again, as I said, in the past, we've always talked about downtown and the clay pipes and stuff like that and yet it doesn't seem those of course we've been making projects to replace those but I again wonder what what's the occurrence here that we're having 600 in there clustered outside the area we've been talking about when we get to the project in particular that I'm thinking about I'll stop I'll pause there okay. and we'll answer your question if that's okay that's great okay so the first project is the Western uh, the Parkwood and Western Regional Trunk Sewer, I know we've talked about this a lot of times, we're kind of out there trying to decide when we move this project forward. One of the big drivers of this project is those areas that I showed you that were future development areas, those you know, three new developments that we've been talking to. Um, so on that one, we're probably getting pretty close as those developments start to come forward. Um, so with that, what we've done here is literally just moved the, the funding out because we're not going to be spending the funds that we had previously identified in FY20. So we've kind of moved those out. So really the only change here is kind of shifting the funds out. And what we did is um, we went from, I think it was FY19 to, to 22 and moved those for to you know, FY21 to 23. Of course, the engineering is complete. The planning is complete. We've um, obtained all the easements. We've attained all of our permits to construct. <clears throat> so literally this project is sitting on a shelf ready to go to bid. And again, it's 
it's the timing and we actually have a presentation scheduled for city council on this project next tuesday night so if you're available we um, would appreciate it if you could come if not at least tune in but we will give um, a specific report on this project and the development we're seeing you kind of got an excerpt of it tonight with those slides that's exactly where i took them from i took them from the presentation i'm going to use tuesday night um, but we'll talk in detail about this but the only change to this project is it's trying to move the move that funding out the expenditures out when we may realistically see it move forward and if it's not time then as we review this again it'll slide out again so again it's it's being prepared for that development um doing that i assume that having a 37 million dollar project moved a year means less pressure on the budget that year but does it cause because are you going to move something else to make room for it in the out years or is it just going to put more pressure on the debt well this pressure on that this it, this project would be revenue bond funded so there would be time before we started paying those revenue bonds back anyways so you know our the way our rate model works it it looks at future projects so you know if it's within the the window it's still going to figure that in and this is figured into our rate model and i'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes okay. and this is including going through under whatever uh the new river to go on yes to the this is a new pump station set in the um Williamsburg, uh, Western Boulevard, I mean, sorry, Williamsburg and Gum Branch area, a new force main all the way out to the land treatment site. And ultimately this project would take everything down to Carolina Forest, pull it out of our existing system, which saves a, on a lot of those improvements that you saw highlighted the yellows and the reds and directs it to uh, the land application site with a for lack of a better term, a different route than going through all of our existing system. Does this include the interconnection between the other section and this? This project not? does not. Okay, no, that, that would be a later phase. So that if something happened to the older one that it could, we had an alternate route for it so that one could be fixed. Correct. Okay. And it, as part of, part of the reason that's not included is because it's not just piping changes it would require, it's, it's not as simple as just running a pipe between them. Um, it would require changes at the existing station, as well as this station to be constructed with larger pumps. So that's something that, you know, will have to be worked out in the future. You, you, we would already have to have significant baseline flow on this for that project to work. So that's why it's a separate phase further out. Any idea where that focus <coughs> might be? Because we've talked about this for a We while. have. Um, it's not in the 10 year window because the uh, the second phase falls um, in the 25 26 time frame it's also in your CIB so I would expect that connection to fall to come probably in the window next year the year after so you're so we're looking you know the plan is construction a few years construction a few years and then the, the next phase and uh, as a side note the construction of this project is like 30 months or something for the existing main station there had been something with the pump before that you're waiting on a part that was a ways back I can't everything remember. it's it's operating normally okay thank you you're welcome uh, Holiday City Mobile Home Park, this is one we've talked about several times. Uh, just to give you an update on where we stand, the uh, property owner, you know, the inside the park itself is privately owned. There was a lot of inflow and infiltration issues. We questioned whether some of those issues were necessitating this project. So the owner did an evaluation, may actually made many of the repairs that were identified in the evaluation and then it's sold to a new owner. So I have to, we are monitoring, but we're not ready to move forward with this project. So all we did was slide the funding out. 
Um, so we still have some questions of whether this project will be needed at the level that we've got it funded. But we won't know that until we have the a final report of uh, the improvements that were made and how well they function. And you know, if you look from 2018-19 time frame when it was so wet to the 2019-20 time frame when it was so dry, everything looked good. But you know, part of it is we got to make sure that you know that drier weather isn't also part of the reason that that looks better. So this is allowing for more time. The Bryn Mawr Force Main relocation, I gave you a, a pretty extensive update, I think, the last time. You know, the, the report findings basically said it was a viable project. We could turn 1.1 million gallons a day um, away from the current system, going to the land application system, to the base. Um, we identified four or five different routes that we could get it there. It is a beneficial project. The challenge was the expense. Um, it actually showed somewhere between five or six million dollars and you know eleven or twelve million dollars, and that's obviously not expen an expense we want to look at right now. We don't <coughs> see while there's a benefit. We don't think the benefit um, matches the expense that would be necessary at this time. Uh, but that is certainly a way not only to gain additional capacity, but to take some of the relief off of our existing uh, <clears throat> collection system. So this is a viable project for the future. We also want to look at, it may be that um, as we make other improvements or identify different alternatives, we can bring the cost of this project down a little bit from that original report. So we left the funding um, pretty much where it was. We didn't take it up because we didn't want to artificially inflate this project. Um, and it is, but it is one that we see will be viable. So we moved it out. And um, as we get back into more of our modeling, this is one of those that we'll look at in greater detail. So really the, the largest change is moving it from FY19 through FY21 to pushing it further in the window 26 to 28. Each of these projects are because there's a risk associated, you know, we're addressing an issue. When you uh, talk about pushing them out, would you also comment not just on the monetary, which we're all interested in because of the impact on the rates, but would you also comment on the risk, i.e., if we don't do the crossover, what's the risk of having the system fail and, you know, we don't have a way to reroute it? In this case, uh, What's the risk if we can't move 1.1 million gallons to Camp Lejeune? It's low, it's non-existent. Well, I would say there's minimal risk at this point. Uh, the real reason to move it is to gain additional capacity in our system. And while um, our model shows that there are improvements that are needed in the Ellis uh, and Bryn Mawr areas, which this is the Bryn Mawr, this goes to the Bryn Mawr pump station, which goes to Ellis and then to our main pump station. As um, we have identified improvements, but they're further out because there's not a lot of developable land left in the Ellis Basin. There's some, but not a lot. And um, the, the major benefit here is to take some relief off of the main pump station. It takes a little bit off of Ellis, but it <coughs> takes a lot off the main pump station. And one of our master plans shows that in the future, and I believe it was in the 25 year horizon, um, we will need a larger or another EQ basin to match the one that's there. And this project actually helps negate that because it turns a million gallons to the base. You know, looking at the, the price tag, on it and what you've just been saying compared to other things that could lower that pressure, how does its cost compare to those? This is much cheaper than trying to build another EQ basin and work it into our system. That's where the real benefit to this project comes in. And then the fact that you have another million gallons capacity. of capacity and 
You know, the, the last, um, I'll let Mr. Thomas do the math, but our, our last expansion at land application was 45, 47 million dollars, and we got three million gallons worth of capacity. So, with, with that, this is actually the very thrifty side. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's not, it's not time yet. Well, you stayed in here that you have that agreement with Unwasa in the base. Are y'all having any issues with that agreement or? No, they, we're, um, we do have an agreement in place with Onwasa and Onwasa has an agreement uh, for treatment at the base. And um, there's, we haven't had any issues, but we're not close to using the amount that's in our, within our agreement. Now this would exceed that amount. So this would require modifications to that agreement. But, but again, that's it, it partially why we're- cost. That's the only reason I'm asking. You said it will yes. affect the cost. It will. To go up more or down it, or either way? Well, it depends on, because we would have to pay <clears throat> the treatment cost at to Omwasa who pays the base. And right now their treatment costs are higher than our treatment at land application. And that so, would be a continuous thing. And that would be a continuous thing. So if you turn, you know, if, and just round numbers, if let's say that it cost us $10 to treat this and it costs 12 to go to the base, you've got that $2 reoccurring cost. Of course, those are very simplified numbers, but there is a larger treatment cost because of the rate with the, the agreement. But it's still cheaper, you know that, right? Yeah, if, right, if, if in the future we're looking at capacity <clears throat> improvements. Thank you. Is the base capacity great enough that there isn't a fear that they might exceed their capacity and, and not they have sufficient capacity they'd actually like to see this happen um because they have a lot of industrial type flow um and this this will be residential <clears throat> flow which would help dilute some of their industrial flow um they would like to see this happen it would help their they've got an advanced wastewater treatment plant and this, you know, according to my contact with the base, this would help their um, plant run more efficiently. But not enough to contribute to the cost. Yeah, I guess, you know, give us a price break because of that, you know? It's just, just $11 instead of the 12. Um, Seminole Trail sewer line is a new project. Uh, this is one that was identified by utilities, ma utility maintenance. Um, we've got major sewer defects. We've actually cameraed that line. Um, offset joints. Uh, we have cracks in the existing line. Uh, bellies where stuff settles out. So we have to go jet it periodically. And then it's starting to translate through on the road. You can actually see the dips in the um, you know, I hate to use the term sinkhole because everybody pictures the sinkhole in Florida that's going to swallow the house. But, you know, just minor sinkholes and dips in the roadway are starting to show through. And we actually have quite a few of these. This is probably one of the worst ones. Um, but a lot of that, we believe, you know, those showed up following Florence. So we think that a lot of this is attributable to all of that flow that we saw there in Florence. So your term major sinkhole does not include eating houses? Uh, we don't have to worry about that. We're not talking about limestone going away or anything like I, that. You've got the term major you sinkhole. Major. I didn't use that. Yeah, yeah that's okay. not major to us. You know, a, a depression area. Not, not, maybe I should have picked a better word there. <laughs> significant? Yeah, significant. A, a nuisance, Problematic? Yes. Yeah, nuisance. nuisance, yes. yes. Major, yeah, you, you know, the, the ones where it's swallowing the car. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. no. Corvette uh, Museum being swallowed up is not the major thing. No, 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 okay. nothing like that. We're here to help walk. <laughs> <laughs> Little Creek Pump Station, this is a um, growth related station. Uh, this station, they, the two developments that I showed you that were along Ramsey Road, uh, that were um, the one was 128 lots and the other was 68 lots. Uh, this is part of the backbone infrastructure that would be needed to serve that. Um, 
It is a hundred percent growth related. It would only move forward as those developments move forward. It would be done through an agreement. We've done this several times before. And then what we would look at is a service area fee. So if you remember, uh, we did this for the Southwest area and um, the, white the North, uh, North Marine Town Center area. So any sewer that goes into that basin pays for the station in addition to the regular system development fees. So they would pay the regular system development fee and then if their portion of this is $1,000, then they would pay an additional $1,000 on top of it to recover our cost. We've done this in several situations. It seems to work very well. So, and again, this is one of those projects that um, before any, any design starts or, or anything like that, um, the properties would have to be annexed and um, the, a plan would have to be submitted. Uh, and the way we've done this before is, you know, typically if that developer is using a local engineer that we typically use also, um, then a lot of times what we'll do is we'll actually contract with that engineer to, because they have all of the base calculations and it just makes the uh, design and permitting cheaper. So, and then there's only one person responsible for making sure that all of the timelines match up. So um, this project is new and it is driven um, simply based on um, that development. So if that development moves, doesn't move forward, then this one will sit. And we actually have, um, I don't know if you recall, but we had one in the Drummer Kellum area that was very similar to this. Mm -hmm. And um, that development didn't move forward and it stayed in our CIP for, I think it was about two years. And after they didn't move forward, what we did is we just marked that, that development pending. So it's still there, but it doesn't show up in the book or any of the calculations. So in order for them to move forward, they would have to come back and go to city council um, to request to move forward and request a CIP amendment. So, this again, new project SERP growth, but it would be funded through a service area fee. Warley Street sewer replacement is um, kind of a small project. Uh, it's replacing a section of pipe between two manholes. Uh, this does serve the Human Health Services building over here on College Street. Um, and Anthony actually responded to a call along that line and as they were was it jet, jetting or camera yeah as they were jetting the line out it got the the jet head got stuck so they had to actually dig down retrieve the head and then um, replace that small section but as they did they realized how bad that that one section truly is so um, this comes from that call and he actually found two different pipe materials that have been spliced together um, and it really wasn't a, a great situation. So uh, this comes from, and this is one that needs to be done sooner rather than later. So you'll see that design and construction are both in 21, but it should be a pretty easy project to design <coughs> and a pretty easy project to construct. And I assume we will do this in house, the design. So that one's not anticipated to do a whole lot of road issues in that area? Uh, we'll certainly have a large patch in that area, um, but it runs, I believe it runs down as you're going past, down Warlick into the neighborhood. It's the left hand lane, correct? Mm -hmm. So we would still be able to move traffic along one lane. Shoreline Drive lift station um, is a wastewater lift station that is just as it sounds on Shoreline Drive. It's actually got a river view. Um, it's if you drove by, the only reason you would know it's there is if you saw the mound of dirt around it where uh, every time there's flooding along Shoreline Drive, that station floods. 
So what we've done is just build a little, you know, dike around that, the lid of that pump station and to try to keep water out. But when you have, you know, a Florence event or something like that, it just, you know, it goes over the two feet that we've come up. So this project is to elevate and flood proof the station itself and then put the controls up a little higher and put a little stand where we can access them. And, and really just to clean up the area because that little earthen dike is literally right off the road. You know, it doesn't look the best. We just need to address it. So uh, this project is in here for FY21 also. Is that down near where the park is? Yeah, so if you go past Sturgeon City and turn left, Court Street runs into Shoreline, you turn left and it's on the right hand side right in between um there's a vacant lot and a house okay. and it's right at, at that property line okay is it road base road instead okay gotcha <clears throat> the effluent transfer station you will not find in your book um, we've marked this one <clears throat> ending and um, there's a couple of reasons for that one is it came out of a recommendation from a panel of ex experts basically saying that it would um, more efficient may not be the right word but it would enable us to move water more easily between lagoons and if we set it up right we could actually create a new station at lts to send water to the irrigation fields so as you know right now, we have three lagoons. The West Lagoon uh, is our operating lagoon, and that's where our pump station is. So if something were to happen at the West Lagoon or at the pump station, where we'll have to store until that's repaired. So uh, the thought was that this would be, you know, located in a different area, probably the South Lagoon, and give us options. Um, it was a significant cost. Um, staff does not see given the cost the benefit of just being able to possibly have that redundancy or to transfer back and forth between lagoons so we moved this to pending did, um, did you consider just having a the pumping about ability from one of the other lagoons what we do right now down? is anthony's actually got a bypass pump and what we've done if we had to move it it's not fast but we set up, we set that portable bypass pump up and pump over. And we've done that from the east, between the east and west lagoon a couple of times. But at the west, fact, I think we did that right before Jill left. Yeah. Were we doing that right before yeah. you were leaving? Yeah, but if the west so. weren't usable, so you had to do it elsewhere, so did you ever consider just having a pumping ability out of one of the other lagoons out to the treatment? Well, and that, that's what this kind of took into consideration is having that ability. But to do it, I mean, it's very expensive. It's additional operation and maintenance calls. And the station that we have now is actually six pumps. So if you lose a pump, it's not catastrophic. Or if you lose two pumps, it's not catastrophic. What would be catastrophic is losing, you know, the concrete intake or, or something like that, which is lower risk. So again for almost a million dollars staff um, did not see the benefit of this um, however it does tie into the next project which is a new project which is to look at a portion of the field um, to convert some of our spray irrigation to infiltration basins um, we've had conversations with the staff they actually um, really liked this idea there's um, we've identified a couple of areas that have potential and um, initial just desktop analysis uh, we looked at converting um, and i'll go ahead and, and share it a small area in block 21 and a small area in block 22 because jill is very familiar with that area um, it's it's one of the areas we can continually go to it's got great um, soil it's where we put out, if you look proportionately, it's where we put out the most water. Um, and just based on a, a preliminary detail, um, the hydrologist is thinking that 
you know, a basin could be anywhere from a million and a half to five million gallons a day, which could handle some of our base flow. Um, in addition, that might increase our treatment capacity and also. So there could be dual benefits there. And if we did that, um, you would probably want to feed that separate from the existing um, infrastructure. So you could still irrigate and you could run this separately or on days where you can't irrigate, you can still run the infiltration basin. So there's an idea that there would probably be some small station associated with this. So while you're, you, you still get the benefit and not necessarily have to have two separate stations. What's the net? I heard you say what the gross was, but obviously you'll lose the use of that area for spraying. So what, what was the take up in the spring that you'll no longer have? We don't know yet. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. It depends on the area. We haven't got far enough because, I mean, really the, the only thing we've done is um, a, literally a desktop analysis based on soils, um, infiltration rates. Um, I think they included buffers in that. You know, there's certain mm -hmm. buffer requirements. So as you start doing that, it really narrows down the area, but that doesn't include any actual testing in the field. So that'll, that'll be to follow and we'll be able to report some of that. And my only concern is if you're only getting a 10% gain for, you know. I think you're gonna find it's much more than that, even at 2 million gallons a day. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think yeah. ten, and I think what he's looking at is okay if it's if it's ten acres and it uses that used to be your heavy spray area for ten acres and you no longer have that for spraying, you're using it for infiltration, but then you still need to spray and the other areas aren't as if it's good. But that area probably if you were irrigating it saw one million to two million a month, not a day. Exactly. Yeah. So at two million thing. gallons a day, I might be doing like that close yeah, down the hall or yeah. something. So, you know, <laughs> potentially a big payoff. Well, yes. that's what I was yeah. asking. Yes. Yeah. It's, we, we haven't done the calculations yet, but in addition to that, as we're spray irrigating, even though we go back to it, we're only on it every like third day, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it would be major major gains if we if we were able to do this That's what I was trying to and and you know while it's a significant cost it's much cheaper than expanding irrigation or anything like that they're not creating more land for you out there no they're not no. especially land that will absorb <laughs> this is a combined project so it's water and sewer it's Sanders school in Thompson and all we did is move the expenditures out and we moved them for 21 22 to 28 29 and I know that sounds like a far move um, this had been in the capital improvement plan for I think three years and it just kind of stayed in the same spot but we've only been on mobile 311 now for about a year and a half and during that year and a half, all those little dots you saw are not ending up in these areas. I'm not saying none are, but I think as we looked at them, there's only three or four of each in that area. And one of the projects I'm going to talk to you in a minute about shows a whole lot heavier. So um, we're not saying that this doesn't need to be done, but it's something especially for that amount of money, we need more information before we just move forward. So we didn't want to completely take it out um, because it may be something that we need to do in the future, but um, we weren't ready to move forward with it yet. The Black Creek Wells, all we did, um, again, last year, if you remember, we combined two projects. It was uh, a, well, a well and well house rehabilitation and a new Black Creek well, and we kind of combined those together. We moved from wells two, three, four that we were looking at and moved over to well one. And um, all we did here is because that's taken us time is match the expenditures with when we actually anticipate to spend the money. So um, instead of being really in FY20 and 21, we expect those 
to be spread out over 21 and 22. So again, we're trying to be realistic of when we can move that, that project forward. This is the project that I keep mentioning. Um, this is a new project. It's the Branchwood service line replacements. The, um, in the last year, actually it's a little bit less than a year, use, utilities maintenance has responded to 64 service leaks in this subdivision and a couple of main repairs. But by and large, it's the service leaks that we're having problems with. Um, part of it is the aging lines, but it's the type of materials that were also used. Um, you want to add anything to that? Um, like you said, the past year, 64 water service leaks. Also, the two, past two and a half years, it's been about 130 water service leaks within that area. That's a bunch. Yes. Are so, there any still left that need repairing? <laughs> we repair them as they come in. <laughs> so, and it's, I mean, so the and it's it's really the entire Branchwood area. So it's it's not just Branchwood Drive. It's literally that entire subdivision. They're they're intermingled all over that entire subdivision. So I don't know if it was installation, the tubing at the time, but there is we see service leaks in other places, but they are high, I mean it's obvious they're highly concentrated in that area. So the ones that you've already done in the last two years, those wouldn't be done again correct you just be doing all the rest correct because especially now I'll, I'll say that with a caveat some of the ones we did in the in the beginning of the first two years they went in and literally just repaired the spot that was leaking. as we realize that these are a whole lot larger issue especially I think you went to one and there had already been two repairs on that one and and he's like look we just need to replace it so now when we go we replace that whole service line from the main to the meter. So we on the ones we have replaced from the main to the meter, we won't have to go back and do those. But on the ones where we just use a three-part union to, you know, close that leak up, then we'll need to go back and and repair those. Okay. But the main so lines are okay. Them. It it appears to be that the leaks are primarily on the service lines. But yeah. you don't have to go through the street or anything to get to Some right? of them will have to be in the street to, to tie into the main. Okay. Um, we haven't done a full <clears throat> evaluation of the main, but uh, my expectations are that we'll go down to the corp stop, which is what goes into the main, and we'll go to the corp stop and replace from there to the meter box. So, um, again, a, a large project, time-consuming. It'll probably be... Um, slightly aggravating for our residents, but necessary. What's the lesson learned on the poor material? I don't know. Do you have anything? Was that, that was that because of the standards of the state at the time? They changed it, over time. Or was what that we because the contract, the construction people were trying to cut corners? Or well, those are about the, 50 years old, aren't they? I would have expected it was probably constructed in the 80s. Yeah. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And we could also ensure in the contract, you know, specifics on material used. That's something that Jason and I could, could talk about before, you know, we proceeded. And we do have standard. We not saying we didn't have standards at the time. I'm sure we did. I just don't know what they were. <coughs> but I mean, we would we would require everything to be installed in accordance with our our manual specification well, standards now, in which but. the material used between the road and my house, okay, the property that I own, was substandard, and that was the contractor, and, you know, I don't know, I got past the inspection or anything, but every house on the street had to replace the sewer, you know, going out because he used a material that collapsed, failed, whatever, and I'm just wondering, you know, if it was the standard <clears throat> of the state, it wasn't inspected right, what lessons can we learn? I, I know you're going to tell me that today we're using state-of-the-art and high technology and everybody's well-schooled, but I just wonder if, you know, we can look at this. And, uh, you know, unlike downtown where you, you know, got uh, clay and wooden pipes. You know. <laughs> we don't have any wood. We do have clay. Yeah, but we don't have any wood. Right? <laughs> I don't know that we ever had wood. But, well, we need to go back and get that picture that was shown in this uh, 
group. Is there one? There was one. There was one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what predates it? Yeah, predates a young man like you. <laughs> now, do y'all have any other subdivisions you've identified having that type of material that may need this in the future? Or a cluster of issues? Or, you know, similar to it. With those There's material. We can, we're getting to the point where we can go and start breaking it out by area. I mean, but again, we've only been collecting uh, reliable data from utilities maintenance over about the last year and a half. So we so really don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh <my laughs> Pete did a great job. You know, it's, but it's, you know, we just didn't have that technology. You know, we weren't using that. We were, we were relying on paper work orders. And over time, we've gone to now, instead of having paper work orders and having to try that, to try and track our work, now it's literally GPS located. You know, we can almost pinpoint the spot that the leak is occurring, and that's how we track it and follow it. So it's um, no dig on P. It was, <laughs> it's literally, you, you know. Did, you the, did wonderful considering the system that you have. Absolutely. It, it is being able to use the technology that we have. Can be a great thing for tracking stuff. Yes, it can. Um, Ellis water tank upgrades. I think we talked about this one um, a little bit before, but this is a new project. And um, it originally, I think in one of your older, the draft version of the CIP that you had, it was labeled um, booster, booster station for Ellis. And what we did is we went back and labeled an Ellis water tank upgrades. The, the problem with Ellis water tank is um, the height and size does not match what's in the commons. So the commons water tank is really what drives the pressure on that in, in what we call the high side, the, the higher pressure zone of town, which is along um, really along Western Boulevard um, over to Belfort Road. Um, and all the way up, I guess, to, to technically Gum Branch along 17. And um, the Ellis tank, um, literally, the commons will fill the Ellis tank and push it right out the top. Um, so unless we figure out a way to have a pressure re regulating valve and then a pump that overcomes the system, or in John's research, he found a company that actually go out and raise the tank, um, we can so we can put it back in service. How much higher do you have to raise it? We don't know. We haven't done that calculation yet. So this this is based off the number is kind of based off that booster pump station, but we'll certainly evaluate. We we'll look at several alternatives. So um, the the real challenge here, the the great thing about this tank is we get cellular revenue off of it. So it's not like it's a worthless tank just sitting there. But the problem is not being able to use it, if we take the commons tank offline, it doesn't have the capability to support the high side. So we need to, it needs to have that capability. We need that redundancy. And that's where you also mentioned the Bryn Mawr tank, I think, or there was another tank I thought you mentioned. We'll get to that one too. Okay. <laughs> so and we have, is it Bryn Mawr? Rimmer on that side? Rimmer was the other, was the, mm -hmm. uh, on the high side too. There used to be, the, the other issue with Ellis too is that we can put it on the higher low side. It, it's a valve by, and Andrew knows where that's, a valve by the school over there. But the problem is, is that if we take the commons off line for maintenance, which it needs, Ellis is not high enough. So everything that's two or three stories up on the high side, we could run them out of water. The other problem with it is, is since that water does not come out of there, we don't want to give our customers stale water. Right. And I got to end up dumping it after we chlorinate it and spend all that money on it. So it's, it's just not a good situation. Yes. Um, Gum Branch Central Chlorine. Uh, the Currently, Gum Branch Central is located right past Rock Creek. And it's where all of the Black Creek wells along Gum Branch Road come into. And then at that location, there's a, a clear well that I reported to you at the last meeting that we're in the process of uh, 
regular maintenance. So we're we're cleaning, maintaining, and coating that tank, uh, that clear well to half a million gallons. Um, we feed chlorine at that station. Our biggest concern is while we don't store a lot of chlorine there, we do store chlorine gas there. And I don't know if you've been by there lately, but Rock Creek is in process of expanding. So they've actually cleared the wood lines right up to our property line. And it appears that they're gonna build houses right up to our property line. So with that, you know, we just wanna make sure that the area is as safe as it can be. It's no longer, you know, kind of over there by itself in the woods. So we think that we need to kind of reno renovate that building and, and add some sort of chlorine scrubber system to it. Does it have any kind of alarm or anything? For it does. It? And it's monitored 24 hours a day. But so, it and it's got an auto. Here, or is it just alarm to you? No. No, the alarm might, well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't hear it there. Well, they might be. There's an external. Yeah, but yeah, there it is. It, they just didn't know what it was. Well, the bad thing is they may go investigate, <laughs> which is probably the worst thing you could do. So, um, but we do have, it does, the, it is, currently there's an auto shutoff system. So if something happens, it's supposed to automatically close the bottle. But you're relying on that one system and, you know, hopefully that doesn't fail. Yet. So the, the idea would be at our, where we don't store chlorine there, we just use it. Um, we store chlorine at our land application site. And it's in its own building and it's got a full scrubber system and the building is completely sealed. And we have a risk management mm -hmm. plan that we go through on a quarterly basis to ensure that everybody complies. But being that development is encroaching now, you know, we, we think that it would be prudent to go ahead and, and get this system in place. So chlorine is or is not it, well, stored? He, well, he has, it says stored on there, it but does. what it is is there's there's four bottles on the scales and he uses one at a time. So they're they're online as one one empties, another comes on. Yes. So that's what he's talking about being stored, but they're really online. Okay. So, so yeah, it's kind of a... Our, our, when they need to, to refill bottles or get new bottles, they go out the land out. So it's all concentrated in one area. The well rehab program, this is a ongoing pro program. It's been in your CIP now for several years. Um, all we did here is move, we shifted all of them one year. Um, and that's because we got behind with the first project that we started. So we're not, we're not at a point now where we'll be ready. Um, if you recall, the, the first project I showed you with Well One um, goes all the way up to 22, and then the next one was scheduled to start in 22. So what we've done is just shift these one year. And, and that's everything in the program. So it's, um, it still follows that every other year program. It's just everything's shifted money-wise one year or expenditure-wise one year. Okay, because that's not how it shows up on our sheet. It has everything in 2023. There's, but if you go to, give me just a second. So the next program would be on page 61 and then 63 and 67. So I just kind of lumped them all into, I would lump them all into one slide, but it's really four different projects in your CIP. Ah, okay. Every other year, it it's every, 29 to 31, 31 obviously doesn't show up. But. Yes. Okay, because it had the 250,000 on each one of these, but you have 250,000 total on that one. Yeah, it, it, I did it just, it's each one is 250,000. I was just trying to fit it all on one slide. Instead of adding it all up, I didn't want to, I didn't want you to think you had one project that was, you know, a million dollars. In one year. In one year, yes. So that's, it's just, this slide represents the program. It's 250000 per project, and it's spread out. 250000 times four. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Joe McKellum, waterline extension. Uh, 
this project, um, we just moved out one year. And again, it comes down to staffing availability, pressure, um, development pressure. And though this project would connect our Commons tank out, come down Drummer Kellum Road and connect in at North Marine Town Center to our existing system. And what that would do is create a looped system for that area of, of our water system. We don't have, currently, we have a line that extends out and was extended out as part of the North Marine Town Center development, but it's a dead end line. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing out there. So we have to periodically go out and blow that off um, until we get that looped and we get, um, you know, additional demand on that system. I think, does that have any impact on your ability to get that commons tank cleaned and relined and all that no, stuff? This would simply be for looping. And really, I, our model shows that there's really not even any real pressure gains. It's just literally looping for water quality, and it does help if you get extensive development. So again, we just shifted one year. The water plant odor control system is a new project that was requested um, at our water plant. It is currently we have um, two bio scrubbers on the mixing tank out back. So if you're if you go by there, if you remember from your tour, there's two big white fiberglass tank looking things out there. Um, the mixing tank was actually constructed to have three and then the associated blowers and those kind of things. And we will need those as we get operating more trains. Um, and on some days, if you go by there and we're running um, three or four trains, you can smell around the plant and we want to be good neighbors because there is a neighborhood behind that. So. You know, while it's not necessary right now, we it is something that we foresee in the 10 year window. Um, so we've put that in FY 25 and 26. Joe, you want to add anything to that? No, sir, that's, that's dead on. You know, we haven't used, there's a, well, there's a chemical scrubber, which we haven't started using yet. Uh, I'm not sure how efficient it is on John might know. So we might be able to use that for a little while, but guaranteed we're going to have to get rid of some of that, that oil that's coming out of those bio towers soon, sooner than later. 25, yeah, by around that time, for sure, we're going to have to definitely start. And then the other water tank that I mentioned, this is a uh, new project. It comes out of a model and master plan effort that we did uh, shortly before Greg left. And the this project um, is to construct a new water tank that mirrors the commons tank in the Yop Road area. We do have pressure problems um, in the Yop Road area. It is on the low side, um, along with Northwoods and downtown and um, you know, portions of Hargett Street. So what our model showed is if we had a um, water tank that matched the commons somewhere in this area, we could actually put the city on one pressure zone and you could either eliminate the existing low side tanks or you could figure out how to use those as additional storage. Um, so, which would take some retrofitting, but um, it also showed that if we grow in this area, it gives us greater capability also. So this is, um, this project, it just does fall in the window. Um, again, there's, um, there are current pressure challenges out there. Matter of fact, all of the um, all of the businesses in that area have to have booster pumps for their fire suppression systems um, because we just don't have sufficient pressure. What size tank would it be? Uh, though the Commons tank's one and a half million gallons, so that's what I sized it at. Hey. 
I am not the engineer. Greg told me mirror, so I took it to be the same. <laughs> and the estimate came from an actual bid of, that was recently done um, of a water tank that was constructed very similar to the commons. So that was our last um, project, new project or project change. Um, in total, there's there were 20. That's not total for the CIP, the water tour CIP. These were just our adjustments or amendments from when you saw it last. So there's eight water, uh, or sorry, eight sewer, 11 water, and then that one combined project that we moved out. <clears throat> so with that, um, Tonight we're reviewing only the water and sewer projects. Of course, the capital improvement plan also includes stormwater, streets, sidewalks, parks and recreation, transportation. Um, you know, it's much larger than the water and sewer component, but you have um, all of the water and sewer projects that are proposed uh, for the 10 year capital improvement plan. Uh, the only projects that would be funded as part of this project would be those that are identified in FY21. Um, the FY22 to 30 are those forecasted projects. They are used in our rate model and in our um, system development fee model. So anything that is attributed to growth um, is used in calculating our system development fees so that, that those expenditures are repaid um, as development occurs. And then we do have that one project that I talked about being funded by service area fees, which is kind of on top of our system development fees. And then uh, the projects that you've seen tonight both support rehabilitation and uh, projected growth. You know, again, that projected growth is, I wish I had a perfect crystal ball, I just don't. Um, but again, it's, it's based on the engineers and developers that are looking at private development and then using our water and sewer models and master plans to determine how would we serve that development. And then, you know, of course, those, um, unfortunately, even as we're talking to those, we don't always get it right. For example, I believe that at least a portion of the gateway marketplace, which is the public's, we actually had identified outside of the 10 year window, not, um, you know, part of it, the front portion was identified in the, in the five year window. And I think the, or five to 10 year window and the, the back portion was identified in the 10 year window. So there are things that based on development pressure or how, you know, they can put a package together can change how, um, you know, how those come into our system. So it may be something we haven't identified may move forward just because somebody was interested or could, you know, put a deal together to work on that piece of property. If something like that comes along and occurs, you then take that and put it back into the rate model and see what adjustments need to be made? Uh, the good thing about that one is all of the extensions were done um, by private funds so the city didn't have any investment in that project they paid their system development fees for the use of the capacity in the system um, but where it does affect us is while we were thinking that capacity was likely going to go a different direction they've now used some of that capacity we were planning for so if something else moves forward it can you know over time it can impact you know future development so that's the importance of continue to monitor and, you know, update our systems and our master plans to make sure that we're appropriate planning. And then um, I've met with um, finance over the last couple of days, and we have re uh, run the uh, water and sewer rate model and the projects that we have proposed along with um, the draft budget that we have in place um, does not show any rate increases necessary. Um, but that does take into um, the assumption con council continues with their 2.25% um, increase that they talked about several years ago. 
So no additional. Correct. Right. No additional. Yes, sir. Above and beyond the already Above. little steps. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. So there's no 15% are coming up. Correct. Gotcha. And it doesn't, and, and actually um, the rate model uh, with the 2.25 doesn't show any additional increase with this in the next 10 years. Above and beyond. Above those and beyond steps. the little steps. The little steps are going to yes. keep us in line. Yes. Okay. Several years ago, a finance director came down and would talk to us at this time and questions that I might propose to you tonight, they would answer because it was finance. And the things that crossed my mind that I don't expect you to answer and will not affect my support of your plan, but I'm concerned about is if you take things out of this year or next year and move it out one, how does that impact the, and I hear what you're saying, don't worry about it, it won't affect the rate, but does that take a pressure off and then we're going to have excess money, which means they put in the reserve, which means we can't touch it a certain way, or does it push money out, to, uh, projects out that now exceed and we'll have to get bigger bonds or revenues outside? And again, I don't expect you to answer those questions, but if you remember when the finance director used to come down during this, those were the type of things that we could get from her. And I, I don't know that, we don't know what that is. I, because correct me if I'm wrong, if we generate surplus, it goes into a reserve and the state has rules about touching the reserve. There's, uh, yes, but it's not, um, if we have excess in go, we can use that. And actually the rate model in order to keep rates actually draws down to a certain level that actually council set as a goal and it kind of monitors that goal. So if we have cash, we'll actually fund some of those capital projects, the, at least the smaller ones with that available funds to match. And then, that's what offsets your future rate increases. And we have, uh, to answer your question, we've looked at the rate model with the projects as you see them here with pushing them out. And that's the, it, the model that shows that there are, other well, than the 2.25, there are no impacts. So we've already looked at that. I, I guess yes. the finance director. And actually, yeah, tell us those things and explain why doing bonds at a certain time or revenues at a certain time because of the interest rate was a good thing and why it went up like this and then dropped off and that's all pressure on those rates i i trust you 100 percent that you talked to the finance director and they've assured you that there's no going to be any rate increases i'm just saying i i don't quite understand as well as i think i might like to what the impact of delaying things are well and we've the plan was to um, actually bring just the changes to you tonight and have another meeting to discuss this where she would come. Um, but as things have developed very quickly, you know, I wanted you to be set up if you wanted to make a decision tonight. Um, if not, we can see where we stand in April. I don't. You know, unfortunately, I see closings and cancellations all over the place. I don't know, you know, how that impacts us in the future, but I wanted, you know, again, to be able to move forward if you saw fit. But we did, you know, the last time we ran the late mod the rate model was literally at two o'clock this afternoon to make sure that every change that as I was going through last night, finalizing things, I found some adjustments that we needed to make or some things that didn't quite get moved. So I went back and, and talked to finance again about, you know, updating the rate model again, just to make sure there were no impacts. Well, for the committee, does the committee have any feelings or want to or not want to make any kind of motion about this at this time or to let it go till next meeting? Sounds to me like you're wanting a motion tonight, though, right? I would like one, but if you're not comfortable, I certainly want to I'm get you into a place that you're comfortable. I'm comfortable but I'm comfortable for what they present. So your motion so is... I'll make a motion that we approve it. I'll second. Okay, any additional discussion on the CIP? My, my only additional is, if I would, as I said, I support what you've presented. I believe everything you've said. 
I still, you know, we have the finance director come next time, even if we say we support what you have presented to us, which I think we're going to do, it would be an education for us just as it would be in any other area. We can do that. And for the viewing public. We can do that. Okay, so the motion on the table, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So is there any old business, new business? I have one thing. You'll notice that there was a slight correction to the um, development review update. Um, for some reason, we had a mistake in the original language. So if you were just replace that section with the sheet, and really, I think the only change was to Jacksonville Station. For some reason, it had it located in the wrong spot. We don't know how that happened. I got one. What's going on at Henderson? Henderson Pump Station. Um, Anthony and I were actually talking about that. <laughs> It's been going on a while. It is a uh, we're removing all of the grease, and at your next meeting, you'll have a nice presentation on that. Oh. Mm. With photos. With photos. Lots, lots of photos. <laughs> so, so the viewing Some public. Some unbelievable photos. <laughs> so, so the viewing public understands why you have such a thing about grease. Yes, that is correct. So, but it, that's that's the operation you see at Henderson, and we've actually done that at Ellis, Ellis, and Bryn Mawr. Lots of grease. Yes, so we'll, we'll be able to provide you with pictures and descriptions of, of all of that. And costs. And costs, uh, yes. Well, lots of costs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to pull all of that together for the next meeting. Because I remember so a year or two ago, one of the comments was that some of the high grease problems were not around businesses, they were in residential areas. You're still seeing a lot of that? Yes, ma'am. So no dumping it down the drain. Correct. Anything else, gentlemen? I have one other item, and it's on the census. So first, I think it's important to note that the census is about counting every person in the U.S. And the reason, especially for us, that that is important is that over the last census count, we had 22,000 people that didn't get counted, and that cost the area, not just Jacksonville, but the area roughly $402 million. Um, they're making it even easier to make sure that everybody is counted. Um, we can do it by paper. We can do it online. Um, there will be census takers that come out. Um, like I said, with the 22,000 people that were not counted in the last census, uh, the city, the impact to the city is we dropped um, from the 10th largest city in the state to the 14th largest city in the state. And that was because of the population loss. Um, we also lost a chance for an additional congressional seat. So the census does make um, a major difference. The potential um, effects of the 2020 census is that um, we expect that um, NC North Carolina will show a 10% growth um, increase. Um, we think that we'll gain a 14th congressional seat, so we do think we'll gain an additional congressional seat. And that Onslow County will top over 200,000 in population. Um, which could cause redistricting in Congress, the State House, and um, the Senate, State Senate. So uh, the invitations will likely start to arrive on March the 13th, which is tomorrow. This is what it'll look like. Um, it'll have a code. You go to my2020census.gov uh, and you put in that code and um, you can fill out um, the census information. Um, Jacksonville Mayor Sammy Phillips has challenged the mayor of Greenville um, that we could have a greater improvement in our response rate. And the reason this is big is because um, Jacksonville had a self-response rate of 66.6% .6 in 2010 
when we lost those millions of dollars in funding, um, Greenville had a 63.1% self-response rate, and they've surpassed us as the 10th largest city. Uh, is the only way you can reply is via online? No, you can also do the mail. Yeah. You know if people are calling anyone? Because my neighbor said someone called in, said they were from the census, and the questions they were asking was not what he would have expected. <clears throat> I told him I didn't uh, think they were calling. Uh, I don't. I, I don't have anything that. So says the public they are. needs to know it shouldn't be a phone call. Yes. So it, it should be something they get in the mail, telling them how they can reply. They can reply online, and if they don't get that, um, how long is this going on, and when should they decide that maybe they need to contact somebody? <clears throat> It's the same with your email. If you get something with the census of your email, you know, yeah, how do they get your email? Well, no, I mean, if, to, if, if, you you anything, yes. if you don't get anything, if you don't get anything at all uh, over the next couple of months. I don't have the end date, so I'll have to give that to you. Um, but we do have plenty of information going up. We are using local faces in our campaign. So these are um, some of the pictures that we're using. Um, one of the things that um, we noted, veterans and children under five were undercounted in the census. So we have a large population of under five. We have a large <laughs> population of veterans. Um, this is a billboard, let's see. This is a billboard that's going up around the base entrances. Um, we believe that about 8,000 military related people were not counted um, in the census and partially because they believed that it would change their tax status um, or they shouldn't count here because they're only here temporarily for those three years or whatever. But what we're trying to get a, the message out is that um, if you're here, you count here. So please fill out the census. One of the reasons why, if you're military, you're here and you count here is because when you leave, somebody will replace you. Um, but you're here. When yeah, we're but taking the count. No, 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 but that's right. right. He's saying that, yep. that, that spot is going to be needed because once yeah. you make it, somebody right. else somebody gets else in there. Here. That's right. So, they, you know, when yeah. you quit flying airplanes at New River, they, they bring somebody else in to fly those airplanes. <laughs> so we have to have that capacity to handle that person and their family. Mm -hmm. They're still looking for census takers, so if anybody's interest, the starting pay for the Onslow region is $15.50 an hour, and you can go to 2020census.gov slash jobs to apply. And again, if you want any more in information, please go to 2020census.gov. I know a retired, okay. retired chemist looking for a part-time job. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next regular meeting is scheduled for April 9th. Um, you have the invitation for April 14th. So um, we would hope that everybody can make that. And um, we'll look at the business that we have for April 9th and decide if we need to have that meeting or if we can have the May 14th meeting. Okay, thank you. Anybody have anything else to bring before the committee? Barring nothing, can I have a motion to adjourn? A motion we adjourn. <laughs> Jill, your turn again. I'll second. <laughs> Seems to be the two of you the same yeah. thing. In that case, we are adjourned. Thank